assalamu alaikum uh, now this lecture is on the topic of hormone replacement therapy in uh, females uh, the objectives would be to see the uh, basically the background of the requirement of the hormone replacement therapy uh, that is why uh, we require to give uh, the hormone replacement anyway what is the underlying diagnosis what is the because diagnosis and the cause really matter as to uh, you know adapting the uh, or selecting the regime or selecting the type of treatment duration the risk and benefit you have to discuss with the patient then uh, moving on to the obviously the history what if, if whatever the cause is what is the symptomatology or what is the reason of the patient seeking uh, to to get this hormone replacement well, and what are the findings on examination for important exclusion uh, if certain diagnosis certain cancer certain risk factors obviously you would need a investigation to see if the diagnosis is correct and what are you what you want to confirm so until unless you know why you are giving a hormone replacement uh, it becomes useless to you know offer then coming to the benefits and risk of hrt in general especially in the postmenopausal uh, females uh, the different management strategies to be adopted and then the regimes so i i hope i will be able to cover this today so starting with the background so usually we come across these three uh, diagnoses to to you know to offer an hrt or sometime patient come with these problems where you have to think about uh, giving the patient a, a hormone replacement menopause which is defined as final menstrual period diagnosed retrospectively after 12 months of amenorrhea we all know the definition of menopause it is usually it is basically a retrospective diagnosis where the, where the lady has not had had a single period for the last one year Uh, and then you label that patient or lady to have a menopause and usually this happens around 50 years of age in 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 general in most of the populations uh then what is early menopause this is having the final menstrual period at or before age 45 and it happens in about 5% of the population this is the early menopause like it is a menopause but it occurs a bit early um uh, and usually it is a normal phenomena as well and you can see the age limit is usually 45 or before that then there is a condition uh, or a diagnosis which is called primary ovarian insufficiency this was formally called premature menopause or you can also recall we've had a lecture on this before it is uh, almost similar as premature ovarian failure so there is a prolonged amenorrhea at least more than 4 months with elevated fsh prior to the age of 40 so i hope you can appreciate that there are different age cutoffs in these diagnoses where you have to think about the because age wise the risk factors for various comorbidities arise and you have to keep them in your mind uh, when you're selecting hrt or select and you are counseling the patient for the duration of hrt uh about a bit of a summary of of the timing of menopause to understand because uh this is the productive life reproductive life of a female or a woman who undergoes several uh, phases and where the hrt has its role to play um when the menopause is nearly around 50 years and the period between i mean if someone is having an a a, a, a phase of amenorrhea for in the uh, at or before 45 uh, at or before 45 year of age uh, up to 40 years that's the early menopause that i was talking about and less than 40 years is definitely a premature uh, menopause or premature ovarian failure primary ovarian insufficiency uh, these are the different terminologies which have an interconnected explanation and uh, you must know them all with slight differences and so on So these may be the several symptoms which with, with which the patient can present especially uh, as they are mostly the symptoms of menopause because the ovarian function has declined so uh so since the ovarian function has declined and that reflects that this is um, 
the reason of the menopause. So it can have its effect just like those uh, in which uh, the symptoms which happen in at the time of menopause, same symptoms can happen in, in all such diagnoses where ovarian function has ended. So a woman or a lady can present with uh, vasomotor symptoms, which include hot flushes, night sweats, sleep patterns, insomnia, irritability, short term bravery loss, and concentration. Um, she can have a sexual dysfunction, which can be related to multifactorial reasons. Um, and uh, there can be different disorders related to sexual desire and arousal, several orgasmic disorders, sexual pain, like dyspareunia, vaginismus, and genital pain. There can be psychological symptoms like depression, anxiety, irritability, lack of energy, and so on. And obviously, the genitourinary symptoms cannot be you know, overlooked because many, many a woman come with just urinary tract symptoms and genitourinary tract symptoms. Uh, obviously, when you have had uh, a history, an overview of what, why the lady has come to you, then, then you, you have to uh, do certain assessment, which can be related to the examination and other background like past history and so on. So first of all, establish whether it is menopause, perimenopause, primary ovarian insufficiency or whatever. What is the age? What is the, the duration of the period? What is the menarche and so on? Review the symptoms why the patient has come. Does she have hot flushes? Does she have infertility? Does she have a problem with irregular uh, in, uh, in periods and so on? Assess for risk factor, risk of osteoporosis. Uh, then what does a woman think? What is her view of getting on to the HRT requirement? Because some women just hear that, okay, if we get hormone replacement, we'll be able to you know, cope up with the symptoms because sometimes they may not. Then what is the patient decision? And you should clearly record that and document that with you. You should know that this patient requires HRT for this purpose. That's why I'm giving her, uh, you know, so so and so on treatment, and whether the patient needs contraception or not. Because even at the uh, age of 40, 45, and up to 50, there's a chance of getting pregnancy anyway. Take the family history of cancers like breast cancer, bowel cancers, and ovarian cancers. Any history of deep venous thrombosis, that is DVT. Uh, risk factor for stroke and cardiovascular diseases and history of migraines. Because when you will start the patient on estrogen and progesterone uh, treatment, uh, these are the there will be side effects which can be related to these factors. So you should know them whether the patient already has such problem or not. So uh, next step is to examine. And as you can see here, you have to take the BMI, the body mass index the blood pressure, whether the patient has hypertension or not, the patient is obese or not. Assess for any breast or pelvic masses, any breast nodule, any, any masses in the pelvis like ovarian mass or, or, or any inflammatory disorder going on, infectious disorder going on. And encourage screening for both cervical and breast cancers through uh, different investigations like pep smear, mammography, and so on. So, so uh, let's uh, moving on to the investigations. Uh, establish the diagnosis uh, by you know uh, diagnosis by checking for the FSH. Obviously, this is the menopausal hormone, so you need to see whether it is raised or not. If it is more than thirty or forty on the day three to five, usually uh, the follicular phase of the cycle. And uh, that, that can denote that, okay, the, the ovarian function is now declining. If a patient is amenorrheic, then early two samples, two weeks apart, would give you the answer, the answer and that will be sufficient. If the patient has been amenorrheic for a long time, then you won't wait for a second, for a, for a period to come to decide whether to the day three to day five where you have to get check the FSH. So you can just check the FSH at the spot and repeat the sample after two weeks in case a lady is amenorrheic for a long time. Exclude other causes of you know, presentation of symptoms like sweating, hot flushes. So um, does the patient have pyochromocytoma? Check for role of corticolamines, whether it is required or not. Uh, and you have to see the symptoms like fluctuating blood pressures, any hypotension, um, you know, sudden onset sweating, and what is the pattern of sweating? So you have to exclude that. Then role of 5-hydroxy indole acetic, as, uh, acetic acid that is related to the serotonin syndrome, uh, sorry, carcinoid syndrome. 
and then that, that can also cause flushes and you know vasomotor symptoms just like just like meno, uh, menopausal symptoms and then role of testosterone whether the patient has uh, sweating and uh, such uh, features because of some androgens high androgens or androgen producing tumors suddenly uh, the testosterone can also help you decide if the patient has other pathology like polycystic ovarian syndrome or uh, ovarian hyperthecosis at the you know age where menopause also occurs so you can you know look back into the presence of any hirsutism weight gain and so on then risk risk can be further assessed through mammography genetic screening endometrial assessment bone assessment and this can help you, you know, uh, for uh, assessing breast cancer and uterine cancer or any family history of any osteoporosis. Coming on to the uh, treatment now, really. Now we are going to talk mostly about hormone replacement in my lecture. Um, these are the various uh, pictures of various types of, you know, various... Um, roots of uh, HRT through which HRT is given. As you can see here, uh, they are injected through uh, vaginal injectors into the, into the cream forms. They are given subcutaneously through these implants, uh, subcutaneous implants. Pills are kept in the subcutaneous tissue. Then these are cyclical pattern of the pills you can see here. So these are the various regimes which we are going to talk now. First of all, let's discuss what are the benefits of HRT. Um, benefits come for, the patient can come for these various symptomatology as you can see here, I've broken them into these four types. So patient can come to you for these and then you have to assess whether they are really present and if the patient can benefit from them. So HRT can you know, help in vasomotor symptoms, in urogenital symptoms, in osteoporosis and colorectal cancer. Risk or uncertainties of HRT are the risk of breast cancer, venous thromboembolism, endometrial cancer, gallbladder disease, uh, and then there are other uncertainties like coronary heart disease, stroke, dementia. So studies, and I'm going to discuss a few in the next slides too, but some studies have really shown some risk. There is a risk, some, some risk of breast cancer. Uh, why and when, in what population we are going to talk venous thromboembolism, endometrial cancer, and gallbladder disease, but there are inconclusive results or inconclusive uh, risk related to the presence or development of coronary heart disease, stroke, and dementia. So you see HRT is related with certain, uh, these types of comorbidities. That's why we have to take a thorough history in the beginning, uh, whatever the, lady, whatever the uh, symptom patient or lady has presented, but you have to know these things to decide your treatment strategy. So the management strategies are various preparations available. They have different strengths. They are available in different combinations. There are different routes of administration as I've just shown you a picture. Um, these uh, preparations can be given in cyclical or continuous form. Um, routes can be oral, transdermal, subcutaneous, intranasal, vaginal, and uh, usually uh, HRT can actually be started before actual menopausal amenorrhea begins. So the, the, the meri perimenopausal time when you can, you know, if you're so, um, so sure and determined with the symptoms that these symptoms are perimenopausal, there is no other reason. Patient has not achieved menopause yet. But uh, since the patient is so much symptomatic, then HRT would benefit in such patients. Benefits of non-oral roots of HRT. So obviously you have to decide which route you have to you have to choose. Uh, you you know you should know that other than oral, there are non-oral routes which can have certain benefits. Like for example, uh, development of venous thromboembolism, that is the VTE. Less there will be less impact on clotting factors if you choose a non-oral route because if you choose the oral route, the drug has to go through the liver and can affect the synthesis of clotting factors. Similarly, migraine would be less likely if you choose a non-oral route. Malabsorption diseases like steady absorption over 24 hours uh, would be affected and non-oral route would benefit in that case. Uh, if the patient has gallstone, then that should be, uh, the oral route should be avoided. 
and if the patient has a liver disease again the oral route should be avoided because the the hrt would would avoid the first pass metabolism in the liver and can have more serious side effects rather uh, than unusual than the usual ones so rule to choose which treatment depends on two important factors that is uh, upon, uh, upon the factor that whether the patient is hysterectomized or not if the lady does not have a uterus if she has had a hysterectomy then estrogen only is the is the hrt to select and there are various preparations for each estrogen if the patient has a uterus that is uh, there is not not uterus is not removed for any reason or is still there then you have to give both estrogen and progesterone either as cyclical sequential preparation given a combination or continuous form and sometimes such patient quarterly progestins for 14 days every 13 weeks would work i'm going to talk more about it if the patient is a perimenopausal a uh, lady then monthly or three monthly cyclical regime would be uh, more um, you know favorable she would like to have a period every month right and a continuous type of regime is not very uh, useful in such ladies because of the irregular bleeding associated with continuous type of regime which is not very much you know comfortable to the perimenopausal female because she is used to with the periods for her whole life whereas in the postmenopausal lady a uh, predominantly combined used and uh, accepted combined regime is used and this is mostly accepted because there is lack of bleeding in the combined formulation of estrogen and progesterone where you can have no menses actually but the patient is receiving hrt in any way um there are other preparations which can also be used in postmenopausal so postmenopausal is a very you know a uh, kind of a uh, open area where low dose hrt or a high dose type of oral contraceptives can actually be used but depends on the severity and the requirement and the, again the risk benefit ratio is very important here um irregular bleeding can occur in postmenopausal female in the first 4 to 6 months um despite being on combined used combined form of uh, hrt and that does not really warrant investigation unless the bleeding is heavy it persists beyond 6 months and occurs after a significant period of amenorrhea because you see the irregular bleeding after the the menopause which is also called dysfunctional uterine bleeding is sometimes associated with the risk of endometrial carcinoma so you have to be careful with that now coming to the various regimes that uh, are used for hrt Uh, the cyclic combined regime this is a regime in which the progesterone is added sequentially for 10 to 14 days every 4 weeks with the daily estrogen so it is a, a combined regime but the progesterone is given cyclically that's why it is called cyclic combined regime the most popular cyclic regime consists of 0.625 mg of conjugated estrogens on days 1 to 25 of the calendar month plus 10 mg of medroxy progesterone on days 16 to 25 of the same so so there is no gap there is no no pause of uh, you know hrt as such especially the estrogen and you are giving progesterone in the cyclical form so this cyclic combined regime moving on to the continuous combined regime where both the drugs are given continuously unlike cyclic therapy continuous estrogen progesterone therapy both hormones given every day induces amenorrhea in most women estrogen and progesterone can be administered separately as well there are also a number of continuous combined preparations both estrogen and progesterone in one pill and if the standard dose estrogen is used recommended progesterone doses would be medroxy progesterone 2.5 mg per day and natural progesterone 100 mg per day so you see there are different types of uh, estrogens and progesterone uh, preparations available which can be used and if you giving in the combined form in the com- continuous form rather than in the cyclical form there is a chance that the patient will develop amenorrhea which is the res- requirement mostly in menopausal women so and usually they are given in low doses remember when you give hrt in the menopausal women or in the post menopausal uh, for the post menopausal symptom purpose the low dose of hrt is enough for them 
because they just have to get relief with their menopausal or vasomotor type of symptoms. Whereas in, in younger females, sometimes you have to give higher doses. Um, uh, the purpose can be to, to you know, achieve contraception as well. So for that, you may need higher doses. Then coming to the quarterly progestins for 14 days, every 13 weeks. Every 13 weeks, you are, you are doing a withdrawal bleed. You are attempting a withdrawal bleed after every, every three months. So uh, that's what is required with the progestins. And administration of medroxyprogesterone acetate for 14 days every three months is a strategy for women who have difficulty tolerating progestin therapy, but with a slight higher risk of endometrial hyperplasia because there is no menstruation for three months and after three months you're getting a withdrawal bleed, so there's a chance that the patient may, de may develop endometrial hyperplasia. But again, for that, you may need to assess the risk and screen the patient beforehand. How do you follow up these patients? First visit is after the start of treatment in three months, then after evaluation every one year. Um, at every visit or at, at least after, blood, uh, after every six months, you should check for the blood pressure because of development of hypertension later on as a side effect. Barrier contraception uh, needs to be you know, checked if the lady requires that, especially continue contraception for two years if woman is less than 50 years because there's a chance of pregnancy. And at least one year after uh, one year contraception should be, uh, you know, advised if the lady is more than fifty years old. Now coming to the side effects from the HRT and what are they? So expected side effects: estrogen-related fluid retention, bloating, breast tenderness, nausea, headache, leg cramps, dyspepsia. That's the reason patients develop hypertension. And again, progesterone-related can be migraines, headache, fluid retention again, and depression, acne, mood swings. So you see, both of them can have an effect on the uh, vasculature. Symptoms or uh, uh, side effects common to both are the weight gain. And sometimes there can be um, poor cycle control uh, because of which you may have to switch to another regime. Duration of treatment depends um, on various factors. For vasomotor symptoms, use HRT for or up to five years. Uh, so whatever the diagnosis, that is patient has primary ovarian insufficiency or premature, premature menopause or menopause itself, for those motor symptoms, the, the, the HRT purpose can be used for around five years. For treatment of osteoporosis, delays, it delays the risk of fracture five to 10 years. Some women may wish to change to other medication like raloxifen and bisphosphonate rather than HRT because of its related risk and other, you know, hazards. And so, so you have to know why the patient needs HRT, what is the purpose, so you can decide on the duration, as I've, I've been talking in the beginning. If the, if the patient is a pre has a premature menopause, like that is 40 or 45 years of age, then until the age of 50 to 52 years, the, the duration of treatment is warranted. And now as I was going through, you know, uh, I was, uh, you know, finalizing this lecture, I was going through uh, recent updates in uh, through several societies, like um, uh, there is a North American menopause society by the name NAMS, you can look up to that. And then there are Underground Society and American College of Gynecology uh, recommendations. They say if the lady um, has menopause, uh, vasomotor symptoms or menopausal symptom, and if she or she, she understand the uh, benefits and risk of HRD, then she may continue to take HRD up to 65 years of age or even beyond that. There is no need to stop the HRD just for the sake of the age limit or the duration whatsoever. So you see, um, there are so variations in the management strategies uh, related to the HRT. Uh, uh, duration of treatment for local symptoms treated with vaginal estrogen creams uh, can be, um, you know, limitless actually. And it, since it has a local effect so, and less likely to have major side effects, so it can be used up to as, de as desired. So as we were talking about the side effects and, you know, the hazards and what are the risks and benefits, so there, there are studies which are uh, related to HRT, and one of them is Women's Health Initiative and Million, Million, Million Women Study, which has 
looked up to several parameters related to the risk of cancers and um, IHD and so on, especially the breast cancer. So in the Women Health Initiative, they see that the risk of breast cancer in estrogen alone group was 23% lower than placebo group. So there was actually benefit. Whereas in the combined HRD group, there is increase in risk emerged after three years of randomization. In the million women study, increased risk of breast cancer in all HRT regime, greatest risk with the combined group, the pattern of progesterone administration did not change the risk at any uh, you know, level or at any time of the study. So uh, you see there are different types of studies, different types of patterns used uh, to see the effect on the breast cancer um, emergence. Other options like hot flushes for um, so for hot flushes, you can uh, use uh, progestogens, clonidine, uh, uh, SSRI, gabapentin, propranolol instead of you know the the formal HRT. For vaginal atrophy, there are lubricants and moisturizers. Other than estrogen preparations for, for osteoporosis, you can you can use bisphosphonate, alendronate. Um, selective estrogen receptor modulators like raloxifen, strontium, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, denoxumab, and so on. And there are still other uh, drugs which can be used for menopausal symptoms like clonidine, SSRIs, venlafaxine, and gabapentin. Alternative treatments are phytoestrogens, herbal products, homeopathy, acupuncture, reflexology, and they have their own roles to, you know, offer if the patient does not choose to, to take HRT for several reasons. Or if, they, if you see there are clear-cut contraindications like TVT or, you know, uh, any, any uh, already patient has a, has a cancer, breast cancer and so on, then these are the alternative treatments for her menopausal or vasomotor symptoms to offer. We were not going to, you know, details with, with them. So coming on to the benign breast issues, uh, for breast cysts, uh, more prevalent in HRT users, actually, they're not pre-malignant and do not increase the future breast cancer risk. This is not a contraindication to HRT, and although they will persist, uh, no particular HRT type or route more or less are preferable in such cases. Uh, coming to the fibroadenoma, this is a benign breast tumors. 50% reduced risk with um, oral contraceptive pill, actually. So if you remember that we were uh, going through the Women Health Initiative and Million Women Study where we uh, understood that the est taking estrogen was actually associated with a reduced risk. So here they're talking about OCP which has a 50% reduced risk related to development of fibroadenoma. Uh, may be uh, stimulated by estrogen replacement, if you only give estrogen rather than OCP. There is, this is not a, it does not have any malignant potential and is not a contraindication to HRT. Whereas uh, conditions like atypical ductal and lobular hyperplasia, this is a precancerous condition or pre-malignant condition. ATPI is associated with five-fold increased risk of cancer. There is little data on the effect of HRT. Current practice is not to use HRT where ATPI is proven histologically. So this is a clear contraindication to use of HRT. Uh, whereas mastalgia, this is a very common with HRT use, especially higher estrogen dose and progesterone would do, do that. For example, medroxyprogesterone acetate. Uh, in the cyclical type of uh, HRT regime, reduce the caffeine consumption, reduce fizzy drinks, supporting bra, use of supporting bra, gamma linoleic acid example, evening primrose oil, simple analgesics can help in this cyclic type of cyclical type. Sorry, this is a cyclical type of mastalgia, not the cyclical regime that we are talking about. The mastalgia, which is mostly related to the periods or pre-menstrual pre phase. Um, so these are the, you know, methods how you can combat these, this nostalgia. And if, uh, refer if the, the, the pain is severe for the, for starting denazole, bromocriptine or tamoxifen in such cases. 
if the nostalgia is non cyclical then uh, then see whether it is local or diffuse if it is local then you must refer because there can be underlying nodule or atp are going on or maybe there is fibroadenoma or whatever and if it is diffuse then treat this as same as for cyclical and if still persists then you must refer uh, the patient to the breast surgeon uh, now coming to the actual breast cancer uh, what what does it has to do with hrt so increased risk of cancer of breast with longer term use of combined hrt especially combined estro equine estrogen and medroxyprogesterone estrate uh, no increased risk with estrogen alone the relative risk ratio is 0.77 a individual baseline risk is most important so you must you know screen out that the lady that i am going to start the hrt and with whatever hrt what is the risk of breast cancer that is more important <coughs> sorry current hypothesis is that there is no evidence that hrt initiates new breast cancers it may increase the likelihood of breast cancer diagnosis by accelerating the growth of pre existing tumors risk returns to same as non users within 5 years of stopping hrt no evidence of increased risk in hrt users under 50 mortality is not increased in hrt users and other lifestyle related factors may be more insignificant like smoking obesity and so on, alcohol consumption and so on so this is the you know women health initiative trial that was going on for women and as you can see here that use of estrogen only hrt is actually associated with the lower risk of breast cancer as compared to the the types of you know uh, regimes and the types of ladies or the patients so uh, this is something important to pick up whereas those with combined hrt have a uh, four times extra risk as compared to those who don't use hrt at all so definitely there is a risk but it depends upon the underlying you know uh, baseline risk factor assessment and as as the age advances the bmi is great, great becomes greater than 35 or the alcohol consumption is increased the risk increase um in a similar way <clears throat> hrt now coming to the hrt and uh, cardiovascular diseases what is the relation and what we have to understand favorable effects are seen on lipids waste hip ratio lipid clearance vascular function vascular remodeling there are conflict between studies so we don't know exactly the 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 real you know final stem to put an end or not women health initiative study says that there is increased risk in cardiovascular disease with hrt in older women only and there are observational studies randomized controlled trial and cochrane reviews from 2012 and 14 which says that women under age 60 benefit of hrt are shown so so you see there are still the 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 concrete data the concrete results are still lacking actually uh relation with the venous thromboembolism overall baseline vte risk is 1 per 1000 women per year um oral hrt has an additional 1.5 events per 1000 women per year mostly in the first year risk may be affected by progestin type increased with methoxyprogesterone acid no apparent increased risk with transdermal hrt often transdermal uh, offer transdermal type of hrt if the bmi is more than 30 so that will affect you know that will have a a, a, a kind of a lesser risk with as, as related to the vte if risk factors for vte are present and no indication for west vaginal estrogen systemic hrt can still be used but you have to discuss and if hrt is indicated better use transdermal in such cases other medical issues like diabetes this is not a contraindication to hrt root is dictated by the lipids if increased triglycerides then use transdermal root um, asthma hormonal effect is unclear be prepared to change or stop if hrt gets worse and because of the underlying risk of pulmonary embolism which which may be there thyroid control may be affected by hrd because the thyroid binding globulin goes up 
So check three months after the HRD is started. So you should check the thyroid function test after HRD started after three months. Um, for migraine, it is not contraindicated, but you can use transdermal way. Uh, this may work to um, uh, either it will worsen or it will actually improve. Coming on to the gynecological cancers, uh, for endometrial cancer, if very early and uh, uh, diagnosed very early uh, and surgery is considered to be to have a cure, then HRD can be considered with specialist input generally. However, generally it is contraindicated if the patient has an active cancer, unless you, you know, you know, you, 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 uh, you're sure that the surgery is intended for cure. That means there is no remnant or there is no uh, disseminated metastasis. Then ovarian cancer, uh, there should be caution with HRT after endometrioid ovarian cancer, especially. Uh, otherwise, other types of in a way, other types of ovarian cancers, it is not uh, really uh, really contraindicated. You can still use the HRT for cervical cancer. It is not contraindicated. It, this is not a contraindication to HRT. If treated with radiotherapy, then use combined continuous combined HRT possible because of the possibility of hematometra that may occur with sequential or cyclical type of HRT due to the stenosed cervix. I hope you got this point very clear because uh, if the patient has received radiotherapy, there is a chance of stenosis of the cervix. And if you give a cyclical form of uh, uh, HRT, there is a chance of bleeding, which result in hematometra. Um, vulval or vaginal cancers, uh, there is no contraindication to the use of HRT. In summary, women on HRT tablets have a 28% 20, higher risk of stroke than non-users, regardless of whether their tablets contain a high or low dose of either or both of the hormones. This, uh, these are the you know statements provided by different uh, publications and journals and you know medias. Um, HRT opened my eyes and gave me my my life back. This was the statement reported in, in Guardian in 2015. Um, HRT will not shorten lives, women told after new research was published. So these are the views of different HRT users, which can help, you know, patients to decide whether they should take it or not. And the clinicians to decide with what are the outcomes, what are the, you know, actual real life data shows. Um, and this can help guide, guide our use of HRT in such patients. Lastly, the Cancer Research Foundation in UK says that uh, but it's important to remember that the increased cancer risk with HRD is actually small compared to the many other risk factors like smoking and being overweight. HRD is only reasonable for a very small proportion of cancer cases. Um, so HRD is not to be blamed uh, for, for all that bad is happening with related to the uh, you know, women or uh, the gynecological issues. So I have a few cases in the end to... To, to discuss with you. 45-year-old woman, she had early menopause, presents with severe flushing, not sleeping well, high-powered job in the city, and needs to be alert with work, long working hours. Uh, she has read on internet and was very worried about the HRT risk. Uh, her grandmother had breast cancer age 70 years, what do you counsel her? This lady has a, a hereditary history, a hereditary uh, breast cancer, and we should check for BRC mutation. Uh, despite being uh, BRC mutation positive, she can still be offered HRT. Uh, after explaining the risk, she should undergo breast cancer screening at the baseline and then annual as required. Next case, 53-year-old woman, menopause started age 51 years, severe flushing. She presented with severe flushing, night sweats, and irritability. What are the questions to ask? And what, dis dis what decides if she can have HRT? What risk do you have to tell her about? Yeah. Okay, so you just have to you know, summarize with the background and explain the uh, pros and cons of using HRT in this case. So next, 60-year-old woman, been on HRT since 53 years of um, uh, age for severe flushing, 
plus other vasomotor symptoms. So this lady is already on HRT since 53 years. So the seven years there have, have been passed. I can't possibly come off HRT. My symptoms were so bad before. So she thinks that she can never come off HRT, although she's 60 years. She's, she may be thinking that now I, I may not need the HRT as I'm 60 years. She has high cholesterol and hypertension, which is controlled, well controlled. Um, how do you counsel her and what are the options? What if her symptoms were mainly vaginal dryness during sex or recurrent UTIs? So um, what will be, how will you counsel or discuss this lady with? What will you discuss? As this patient has, a, you know, uh, has been using HRT for quite long and now her main symptoms may be related to just vaginal dryness, then it is possible that you offer her simple estrogen vaginal creams rather than the oral uh, HRTs because she has a high cholesterol and um, uh, that can be the, the, a risk factor for development of stroke in the future or cardiovascular disease. Um, obviously, she would she still require HRT because she's become symptomatic otherwise. And as you said about the osteoporosis, uh, the risk of osteoporosis would still be there and that will benefit it with the use of HRT anyway. So at least we can offer her a local treatment option. And for osteoporosis, we can um, uh, assess if she needs to be put on bisphosphonates or other regime of osteoporosis. So thank you very much for your attention. And this is the end of the lecture. Thank you.